Hello, everybody. You see my face. You see my hat. You see my living room. So that means it's AWA Unleashed Day. We are what we like to call the preeminent, the number one self-proclaimed podcast and video stream dedicated to the American Wrestling Association. If you're watching on YouTube, you see my name, Chris Tubbs. That's my Twitter handle, at CM Tubbs, if you feel so inclined to follow me. If not, you know, whatever, you're lost. I'm excited about today because we're going to talk to somebody that if you were at the reunion, you had a chance to, to talk to this individual. And I really didn't get the opportunity a lot uh, because I was running around. So uh, that being said, first of all, let's uh, go ahead and bring in Mick Karch. And uh, Mick, welcome to uh, your podcast. Thank you, Pelly. It was uh, it was quite an eventful couple of weeks, you know. Um, first with the reunion, and then of course uh, we ventured to the Midwest All Star Wrestling Card. Got a yes, chance to reunite with the with a couple of the AWA boys, uh, Tito Santana, of course, Diamond mm -hmm. Dallas Page, yep, um, a guy that should have been in the AWA, uh, Barry Darso. Uh, so it was it was a good time and, and still kind of coming off the the high of the reunion. So uh, thanks, everybody. You made it a, a memorable couple of weeks. Yeah. And uh, now we're going to kind of we're going to settle back into uh, what we like to try and do. And that's just tell stories about the AWA, because ultimately uh, that's what this this podcast uh, is about. Before we get to our guest here, Mick. Uh, let's go ahead and take care of some business. First of all, you see the logo up there in the corner. Uh, you see my hat. It's courtesy of Soda Stick. I've also got a black and white AWA Unleashed t-shirts. It's brand new. Uh, they first debuted it at the reunion. And if you want one, hey, we're coming upon, we're like just a little over a month away from Christmas, believe it or not, which blows my mind. But if you're looking for something to, uh, to give somebody, you want to purchase it for them, I'm going to put the... Uh, I'm going to put the, the little scroll right there, a black and white t-shirt. You can get a hoodie with your name uh, on the inside. You can get it personalized. Go to sodasticco.com and uh, just type in AWA Unleashed and you can get it. You want it personalized. Minder, if you get it, size up a little bit because they do run a little small. So <clears> size <throat> up because you're definitely going to want I wore mine the other day and uh, super, super comfortable. Um, go ahead, Nick. You know, I, I was going to say about that sizing up, mm -hmm. uh, I ordered one in Metrodome size, and it was still a little bit tight. So Metrodome yeah, size, it, wow. Definitely, uh, definitely size up. So there, you, I, I, I'm, I'm going to have to ask if they have Metrodome size anymore. Maybe you got the only, you might have gotten the only one. You might have gotten the only one. Well, yeah, it was either that or, you know, uh, that Sleep's family of 17. <laughs> So, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, I believe the next size up is probably tent. Um, <laughs> also, hey, you guys, we're getting into uh, winter, so you know that you like to, you know, you want something good to to feed the family. Seventh Avenue Pizza, best frozen pizza on the market. It doesn't even taste frozen. I mean, the ingredients so good. I love the Lucky Seven. They've got a brand new breakfast pizza that I have yet to try out. But uh, after this, as a matter of fact, I have to actually go out and run some errands. And uh, one of those is going to be getting myself uh, one of those uh, 7th Avenue breakfast pizzas. So do you, know, you have some like kind of an in with, with 7th Avenue? I mean, do they kind of like, you know, keep shuffling over uh, pizzas over to you? Because I haven't I haven't seen any. I mean, I've gone to the store 100 mm -hmm. times, paid for them. No, no residual, no receipt, no nothing. I, I'm just wondering if it's a, a perk that you have. You notice that's why it's a close-up today. I don't want to show from the belly down. It's body by pizza, okay? Got I'm just, it. You know, I mean, there, there's a reason I got a little bit of pudding. It's because of the pizza. I eat, but I don't work out. Let me put it that way. Oh, you know, I, I, want, I want to get your shut up. <laughs> oh, God, I love you, but I hate you at the same time. Um, okay, that being said, I'm going to let you introduce our guest because this is somebody I didn't get a chance to talk to much at the reunion, and... I'm kind of bummed because I know we've been trying to get him on for a while and it just, you know, scheduling, whatever has it worked, but we finally got him on and I'm super stoked. I'm going to let you introduce him and then uh, we're going to be off to the races, Mick. 
taking you back to the showboat in 1987, this guy got into the ring and old Slick Mick said, and ladies and gentlemen from Baton Rouge, Louisiana, at 256 pounds, he is Tom Rocky Stone. Look at him. Look at him. There he is. Oh, my God. To be with you guys. Look at him. Look at him. You, you, you look great. You, you know, you don't, you have not aged one day over the 30 years, you know, since you and I worked at the, uh, at the showboat. Yeah, that's bull crap, and you know it. <laughs> <laughs> it's oh. so great to have you here. I, you know, and I know you've been trying to get on the podcast, and and uh, you know we've had we've had some uh, some of the enhancement talents, I guess uh, we mm -hmm. want to call them that uh, over the uh, over the course of the podcast. But to me, Todd, you are right up there in the AWA history books with the likes of the Kenny Jays and Jake Millimans and George Scrapiron and Gadaskis as the most recognizable of all those uh, faces that the fans, you know, really grew up with, a, you know, a generation of wrestling fans. And, and I can't tell you how great it is to have you aboard. Well, I was there for almost 20 years. Wow. It was a long time. 20 years? No, really? I started in like 77 and I was still there when they closed the doors. Man. Wow. Man. So let's, let's kind of start there then. Um, you know, you started there in 77, but I mean, did you, did your family have a, a history in wrestling before that to my understanding? Well, when I got into high school, my dad became the ring announcer in Milwaukee, Green Bay and Rockford. And so I started attending the matches. And I think the first match I remember was Red Bastine and Hercules Cortez winning the tag team titles. Oh. And oh Red God. Bastine was my favorite wrestler at that time. And then shortly later, Nick and Ray won the titles. And I became a Nick and Ray fan. And I became a heel fan in Milwaukee and Green Bay. I'd go to the matches and wear a Nick and Ray country T-shirt. Uh, and had banners made, and I was basically a heel at that time. And then I later became a ring and uh, I the timekeeper for my dad and would keep the time at the matches. And your buddy Nick, I got him one night, I forgot to start the clock, and him and Billy were doing a Broadway 60 minutes. And you I didn't forgot. start the until about 20 minutes in. And Nick, <laughs> kept coming, yeah. Nick kept coming by going, how much time? Because, <laughs> you know, they were in there for half an hour before we called 10 minutes. <laughs> well, you know, I don't it's think. Rest, it's wrestling time, right? I mean, yeah, what, 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 what is the wrestling time? Right. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that there's been a wrestling clock that has been accurate ever. You know, uh, so, yeah, I mean, you were right in line. You didn't do anything wrong. You might have been a couple of minutes off. But, you know, you mentioned a couple of things there. You know, the time frame uh, with Red and Hercules winning the AWA Tag Team Championship and then losing it to uh, to Nick and Ray and then the Nick and Ray T-shirts. And, you know, this is Nick and Ray country. You know what? I, of course, was kind of doing the same thing. You was a charter member of the Bockwinkle Brigade. And people don't realize that was a pretty damn dangerous thing to do back then because people were believing. And if, you know, you're parading those T-shirts around the arena, you were taking your life in your hands. Yeah, but it was more fun to be a heel. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> you know, oh, and that God, was yeah. true as I became one of the boys. You know, Tom, let's talk a little bit about a, a guy that you mentioned, Red Bastine. You know, those of us who were of that era in the AWA, and Red, of course, had been in the business a long time before he came into the AWA, but I, I think he's one of these guys in history that is so underappreciated. I mean, you know, if you were there at the time, you knew how great Red Bastine was. Talk a little bit about him, though. What a professional in that ring. Well, I think he was the best baby face I ever saw. I... uh he was probably the only baby face I ever liked. Uh, wow. But uh, he was tremendous. 
And much like Ray today, they, you never hear about him. You know, and Ray was considered the greatest of all time by the guys who worked with him. And I would put Red up there right with Ray. He was you just know, that, terrific. That, that's one of those things and one of the reasons why we do this podcast is because, and again, to this generation of wrestling fans, and that's not a knock on them, you know, they just don't know. And some mm -hmm. of these guys do not get the credit they deserve. Look at the history of the AWA, and you talk about your crushers and your mad dog, Vashans and Burns and Nicks and so forth. But like you said, Ray Stevens, probably, you know, one of the greatest pure heel performers of all time. Mm -hmm. And Red Bastine, I mean, we came from a, a terrific era in AWA wrestling. Oh, absolutely. I mean, those are the guys, the Rays, the Knicks, the Red Bastines that made me want to get in there and do it with them. And I was lucky enough to get to wrestle almost all of those guys. You know, it's interesting. Uh, you know, before, I know Chris has a couple of questions, but you said something that I thought was interesting. You said uh, Red may have been the only baby face that you ever liked. So that would bring me to a question. Well, we'll leave Vern aside because, you know, the boss signed the paychecks. But growing up in Crusher country, in the heart of the Wisconsin area there, I'm surprised that, that Crusher wasn't a favorite of yours. Well, when I started watching, I don't know if he was on hiatus or not. I don't remember him in those days. Okay. I remember, mm -hmm. you know, it was Larry and Larry Hennig and Lars Anderson, and then it was Red Bastine and Hercules Cortez. And then Crusher did come in after that, but by that time I was already a heel fan. Ah, you gotcha. Know, I was already following Nick and Ray, and Crusher's style never really did much for me. I prefer a babyface like Red Bastine, who is more a typical high-flying baby hmm. face crusher you... was just the crusher i mean he could draw money he was great uh can't say anything he was probably the biggest draw the awa ever had yeah yeah no, baby face. Uh, so you, you you mentioned larry hennig i mean talk about some of your memories about larry larry was when i was a fan he did something one night where the referee got in his face and he got mad. He grabbed the top rope and he started stomping his feet like a little kid and he kicked the bottom rope and he hurt his foot. And I just thought it was hilarious <laughs> that this 300 pound guy uh, is acting like a four year old. I, I found, I found it to be hilarious. And one night we were in green Bay and I was supposed to wrestle Larry. And Steve Olsonowski ended up with a herp, open herpes sore and couldn't oh, work. Oh, jeez. So he couldn't work. So it was either put Woody Wilson, who was there with me, against Brad Riggins, and then me and Larry, and have two crappy matches. <laughs> or put me with Brad and try to have a good one and have Woody go in and work with Larry. So I said to Larry, I said, we're going to switch it. Woody's going to work with you. Do you want him to do the same thing I was going to do? I was going to jump him at the beginning and then use the tape on my wrist to choke him so I could get some heat. Well, so Woody went in and jumped Larry, and you couldn't tell that Woody was in the ring. Larry ignored him like it was a fly on his shoulder. I mean, he just totally ignored Woody like he was not even in the building. Uh, finally, Larry grabs a headlock, and I'm standing in the back with Jim Brunzel and Heenan. And Larry stands up, and Woody's feet are two feet off the mat, and he looks like some girl dancing in a cartoon. And Heenan goes, "Look at that! Look at that baby face! Look at him get sympathy from the crowd!" Oh. <laughs> Jim and I are in tears. I, you know. This is why I, I love having a guy like you on, on the air because these memories are all in here, in here. And again, if you didn't grow up back then, when you mentioned a guy like Woody Wilson, I'm assuming Woody was from your neck of the woods. Woody is from Milwaukee. In fact, he's a cousin of my wife. 
Wow. So, but Woody was someone who never should have been in the business. Oh, come on. Woody, Woody, you know, the one thing about Woody Wilson, and, and we won't belabor Woody Wilson, but I remember whenever there was a pull-apart brawl on television, Woody was generally one of the first guys in the ring. You know, Woody Wilson out of Bangor, Maine, as he was uh, introduced, you know, by way of the, you know, the Milwaukee uh, Railroad. But he was actually uh, from Bangor, Maine. He was. Yes, yes, that was a real. No he, kidding. Yeah, I mean, I don't know when, when he was a kid, but he was from Bangor, Maine. So well, somebody, I, in, somebody in wrestling was actually from the town that they were built? You well, know, I had lived in Baton Rouge, too. Well, Kenny J flew over Cleveland one time, and then all of a sudden he's you know he's from there. But what I remember about Woody Wilson, poor Woody, he was always the first guy that came in with the enhancement train uh, to pull to, you know to do a pull apart brawl or what have you. And the poor guy always wound up being the first guy over the top rope, right in front of the hard camera. And I remember Woody would have his tongue sticking out as he was going over the top rope which was always in slow motion. I, I could never understand why Woody couldn't position himself not to get hurt because it took the guy three days to get over the top onto the floor. Well, I never watched him do that. I've never seen him go over the top rope. So <laughs> maybe it was unintentional. I don't know. But that, yeah, Chris, go ahead. I know you got some more questions. We'll get off the Woody Wilson uh, train here. Yeah, well, I, I want to know about sorry Nick and uh, and Billy. Kind of tell tell me about that, Tom. Well, as far as as far as the two of them, they were two guys. Even when I was working, this is how good they were. You could watch them and still believe it was real, even though you were one of the boys and you knew it wasn't. Yeah. Uh, they were amazing. But Billy, I never for fifteen years, I never talked to him. He never said a word to me in all the TV tapings. And I finally ended up wrestling him one night at the end of his career in Rockford. And uh, he was a heel at the time. Sure. And I was there with Jake the Milkman, and I walked up to Billy on my way to the ring, and I said, Billy, I got to ask you, how come when you were a babyface you were such a prick? And I turned and just went to the ring. And Jake <laughs> said, what did you do that for? I said, well, let's see what he does. Wow, what he did that night for 20 minutes was made me look like Billy Robinson. He had me throw him from one corner of the ring. I mean, he made me look like I was the world champion. And that's my greatest memory of Billy Robinson. And I know he hurt other jobbers. He hurt Chris Curtis one time yeah. where they were supposed to do two out of three falls. But I wrestled him twice. I wrestled him in Milwaukee once when he was a baby when he was a baby face. And both times he made me look like Nick Bachwinkle. See, so, that is the mark of a of a, of a true pro. Yeah. And and Billy, of course, as you said, Tommy, he, he had a reputation. You know, I've talked on this uh, program about, you know, Billy on live TV getting out of the ring and slapping a fan across the face that, you know, kind of got under his skin a little bit. But, you know, and I've also quoted uh, Bockwinkle, you know, when he was going to wrestle Billy, he would sit down with him in the locker room ahead of time and say, Billy, what do you want to do tonight? And Billy would give him his marching orders and you went out and did it. And uh, what a it's a feather in your cap, too. I don't think you should minimize the fact that if Billy Robinson made you look like a million bucks, it's because he knew you could do it. You know, he knew you had the skills to, to carry the load. Well, I was lucky. Almost all of the AWA guys respected my work. And so I never got hurt by any of them. They always had matches with me. You know, I could work Nick on TV, and he let me cover him for two counts. I mean, the one time I worked him, we, I did the thing Red Bastien used to walk up the ropes and flip yeah. over with sure. a headlock, and he let me get a one count. We did it a second time. And he let me get a two count. Well, very few jobbers ever got two counts on the stars on TV. Even covering them was mm -hmm. kind of against the rules. Uh, yes. And wow. guys that let me do that, Jim Brunzel let me give him a pile driver on TV. Vern wasn't real thrilled, 
and was in the back herd yelling, who the hell am I paying to put who over? You know, so uh, guys, I mean, that's, that's, guys who work with me on TV and let me, you know, look like I was trying to win. That is just that, that to me, that's why I love these stories because when you do get those opportunities, you said back in those days, like not everybody got that because you really, when it happened, it had to mean something and you really hooked the fans. And, and to me, that's, I mean, the ultimate sign of respect that they have towards you as well. Yeah, well, Vern didn't want them doing that. You know, Bobby Duncan used to take backdrops, some guys, and sure. Vern would scream about that all the time, that they were let, but if you don't let the job guys, and I hate the term in handsome town, by the way. Oh, you do? I was a jobber. Okay. That was my job to put those guys over. I don't, that was not a negative term. I don't like enhancement talent. Well, you, you know what? I I really I want to stop you there because that is so interesting. Because I've heard it from the other aspect too, where guys, <clears throat> excuse me, don't like the name jobber, and you know they they want to be referred to as somebody who enhanced the appearance of the other guys. But no, you're was, just fine. You're just fine. I was there to do a job, man. That was my job to put those guys over and make them look good. Wow. Okay. okay. I'm, cha I'm changing the banner right now. You're changing the banner? Wait a minute. Hang on a minute. See? Hang see? on. See? Where, where is it? Where is it? Where is it? Where is he change banner? See, you see it right there. It's, dude, open your eyes. It's on the bottom. Oh, there you go. You know, Jesus. here's, here's uh, my question would be this for you. With all the respect that you got from the guys and the hundreds of jobbers that came through the door back then. Why do you think they respected you so much? I mean, and, and I'm not denigrating your ability. Why did they trust you? What do you think was the initial key to opening that door? Well, I mean, trust was number one. But when we, when all of my guys, the Chris Curtis's, the Jake Milliman's, the uh, Rick Cantner's, all of our guys, when we went up to do TV and you sat me down in front of Nick, we didn't let Nick tell us what we were going to do. We said, Nick, here's what we can do for you. Oh, here's what I do best. We made them know that we knew what we were doing. Now, I had an advantage. I had spent a year out on the road in Kansas City and in Mid-South working for Bill Watts. So they knew I knew how to work. So they weren't afraid of me hurting them, and which is more than I can say for some of them. You know, as as the as we got into the '80s and '90s, a lot of the guys coming in didn't give a shit. Right. Excuse my language. No, no, absolutely. I, you know, you you talked about it being your job to make these guys look good, and you know, I, like I said at the reunion, you know, Doctor X, Dick Buyer referred to you guys as the carpenters of the business, which coming from him is high praise because that's exactly what you did. You know, you, you built everybody up. You made them look great. You knew your role. As you were traveling with guys like Chris Curtis and Woody Wilson, Herman Schaefer, whoever else, did everybody feel the same way that you did or were they frustrated that, you know, they kind of knew this is about as far as they're going to go in the business? I don't think any of them were frustrated. They knew that was what, I mean, they got into something they wanted to be a part of. Yeah. And they knew they weren't going to go anywhere. I mean, you got to make a choice, right? I tried it for a year. I was actually supposed to go to Portland later in the year. And uh, when I came home from Mid-South, Wally all of a sudden didn't have a spot for me, even though that's why I had quit down in Mid-South to come up here and work and then go to Portland. So I quit the business for a year. Uh, well, I, I think at that point I got a job at the electric company with benefits and, you know, and so I decided I was going to be, still be in the business, but only on a part-time basis. And once you knew that, they weren't going to make any part-time guy a star. 
So a, a two-part question to follow up on that. Number one, when you realize that, when you uh, – let's go back. Let's take a step back. Did you at any time envision that you were going to be more than a job guy in the business? Did you have, you know, visions of, yeah, I'm going to I'm gonna main event, I'm going to semi-wind up, whatever it might be in yes. any territory, let alone the AWS? Yes, yes. Because I think if one of those other territories had let me become a manager and a worker like Heenan, I may not have been as good as Bobby, but I could have done that. Okay. Yeah, you knew the business. I mean, you. And you, I, you, I knew that I I could have booked the territory if given the chance. So, yeah. it, if if let me let me go back to another thing that you said about Wally. I think this is really interesting because when you're when you're in another territory, when you're in Mid South, and then Wally says, "Hey, you know what? We might have this opening for you." You know, you, and you kind of put everything on hold. You're ready to go, pack your bags, and it didn't turn out that way. Suddenly, they didn't have a spot for you. Well, here's the way that actually. Let me tell you how that actually worked. Sure. I was in Mid South, and Stan Stasiak got me booked in Portland starting in September. September. Okay. So I called. This is probably April. I called Wally, and I said, Wally, if I come back home for the summer, can I work for the summer? I still got to make a living. He said, yes. So I went into Bill and Buck Robley and said, I'm giving my two weeks notice. And Bill said, well, you can always come back if you want. I always got a spot for you. So I drove, packed up my stuff, went home to Milwaukee, called Wally. And Wally said, oh, I'm sorry, we're full. Okay, I just moved a thousand miles because you told me you had a spot for me. So I went and got a job selling car, decided piss on wrestling. I'm sick of it. Yeah. Uh, let Don Owens know I wasn't coming. Found out that I sold cars very poorly because if you came in with full price offer, I probably couldn't make the sale. Uh, <laughs> I actually <laughs> called Kansas City and was going to go back and be a manager and a worker in Kansas City, which would have got me started on my managing, you know, managing career. Uh, and then the electric company in Milwaukee called me and said, we got a job for you. And I decided to take the job with benefits. Because uh, I was married by that time. I really, yeah. you don't want to move on. I don't know how some of these guys do it, you know six months in portland so yeah. that's a lousy life and if you watch the documentary 360 60 days or whatever it is on youtube yeah. it yeah. shows those guys weren't that happy yeah they made a lot of money guys like nick otherwise he lived in minneapolis for 15 years right 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 you know a completely different thing than these guys who were six months here six mm -hmm. months when, when I, th what, uh, I was just going to say, I, I think that's I think that's a really good way to look at it, because we we look at, at least me from a fan, Tom, I look at it and I'm like, oh, it's such a glorious life. And then you find out kind of all the stress that it put on you outside of what we see in the wrestling ring. So, I mean, I I commend you for realizing that. Yeah, I got wrestling, but I also got a real life. I mean, I got a family. I, I got to take care of. I got to take care of my shit outside of wrestling, and, yeah, and for that, I, I mean, wanted, I, I, I wanted to go see my kids play baseball. Yeah, you know? you and go. so I never would have done that if I had been on the road. So I've, I've got no regrets in what I did in the business. I love that. I love that. I really do. Go ahead, Mick. You know, you, uh, you you talked a little bit about uh, you know the start in the business and so on and so forth. We talked about Red Bastine a little bit, a guy that was associated with Red. And I, from what I understand, they really didn't care for each other that much. Was a guy named Lou Klein, and uh, talk a little bit about Lou and and the training uh, there. Well, Lou, I went. Lou Klein was Red's half brother, I believe, yeah. and he ran a wrestling school in Allen Park, Michigan, outside of Detroit. And I went there, and I paid him my money, and in three weeks, I saw him three times. 
And each time I saw him, he showed me how to take a headlock and take a guy over. That was it. And then he'd, Boy, go, that's, he'd that's be home on well, Tuesday, yeah. and then he'd go out on the road. He was like an agent for the Sheik. And so he would be out on the road all week. So after three weeks, I just packed my car and went home. But I'm very good at a headlock takedown. <laughs> <laughs> well, wait a minute, though. So you're paying the guy... The fee, whatever it was, it was, was I think it was five hundred bucks, and oh. I was living in his gym. I had a cot in the back room, but I was there by myself every day for seven days a week, and no one ever came in. So he didn't have anybody helping him with this camp. No, well, he'd have a couple of wrestlers come in, but because I was the new kid in the block, they wouldn't let me grab a hold. They wouldn't let me take him over. They wouldn't let me do anything. So after three weeks, I just said the hell with it. You know, but here's the legacy, Tom. You know, Vern's known for the sleeper, Nick for the pile driver. You had the side headlock takeover. You're damn you know, right. In in <laughs> wrestling, and and damn it, you know what? That's your story, and you're sticking to it. Actually, I usually had my shoulders pinned to the mat, but <laughs> as a, as a wrestling fan, like I love, I I hear about wrestling at the chase. Tell me about going to wrestling at the chase because that is one of those like iconic that, things. That was my first chance at really wrestling. You know, I'd wrestled on some local stuff in Milwaukee, but I finally got a chance to go to the chase. Frank Hill booked me to the chase. Chief and, J. And my first match was against two kids, Dan Diamond and Gary Young. And they beat the hell out of me. They would walk away on a headlock and gave me like 10 backdrops on the St. Louis ring, which is harder than the concrete in front of your house. They just beat the piss out of me. And I'm upstairs and I'm almost in tears. And Tank Patton was trying to console me. And I finally went back in the dressing room and Pat O'Connor said, you've got Brody on the next tape. Oh. So I walked up to Frank who at the time before his gallbladder surgery was about 340 pounds with this giant V body and that face that only Frank Brody could have. And I introduced myself to Frank and he said, kid, in case you're not, I'm not able to say thanks after, let me say thank you now. <laughs> I just had two little guys beat the hell out of me. <laughs> and now, oh, boy, that's, that's the only thing that happened that, and not Frank's fault, he dropped me throat first on the top rope, and I didn't know to put my arm up. So I took it throat first on the top oh. rope. Oh, that boy. That was the worst night ever in my mm -hmm. life in the wrestling business, but that was them trying to get me to quit, which is what they tried to do. They didn't want you in this business. You had to prove yourself. Sure. Right. I did after that. I did St. Louis a bunch of other times. I always got the easy matches. You know, I got Ken Patera, who forgot to finish. And when the ref said, go home, he looked at me and said, I have no idea what we're doing. And oh, so I no. walk him through him beating me. There's something wrong with that picture. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just, I'm trying to imagine that now. Oh my God. Oh God. Who who was booking St. Louis when you were there? Pat O'Connor. O'Connor was. Okay. Yeah. So did did was Muchnick out of the picture there or was this a uh, he wasn't at thing? the chase. He was running the house shows. Okay. I never okay. saw him at the chase. Gotcha. Gotcha. Okay. What boy kind of these are tremendous stories. Um the guy that we, I, I guess, have to thank, maybe yes, maybe no, I don't know what his involvement was in the name Tom Rocky Stone, was that Minneapolis promoter. You know, the that guy was, with the two strands of hair. That, Carbo. that was yeah. Wally Carbo. And that was done because he didn't want Vern to know that I was the son of his ring announcer in Milwaukee because he thought my dad wasn't smart. Oh, Even though man. my dad was totally smart. He smartened me up long before I got in the business. I mean, I knew it was a work from day one. So wait, a, so so Vern, Vern thought your that your dad was not smart to the business. Yeah, 
Even when they had him doing interviews, they didn't think he was smart. To the business. They didn't. Okay. So they didn't smarten him up at all. They just, you know. No, but then Vern didn't know he's smart enough as wrestlers either. Right, right. I had Kevin Kelly in his first match in Milwaukee. It was Kevin Kelly and Regal against me and Brad. Wow. And before we went to the ring, Vern was in town. He said, don't talk to Kelly in the ring. We haven't smartened him up yet. Oh, this is a guy who's 340 pounds of solid muscle. So the match starts, and Rio goes to run my head into Kelly's knee on the outside of the ring. Well, he didn't leave his knee down. He brought his knee up to meet me. Knocked me silly. And so naturally, I started talking in the ring. Got back to the dressing room, and Vern goes, you weren't talking to him, were you? I said, I didn't say one word. And I turned around and said, I said a thousand words. <laughs> Here's a guy who's big enough. I mean, he was literally as big and tough as anybody. Uh, yeah. And yeah. you haven't smartened him up yet? See, that was my thought. I mean, I know Kevin, you know, uh, before he got into the AWA. And, you know, I, I, I've known him over the years since. And of all guys that you are going to want to smarten up, he would be right near the top of the list because he's going to kill somebody. Well, that's what I was afraid of. Wow. Oh, man. Well, you lived to fight another day, pal. I did. You know, I that's... usually did. Tom, talk about, as you look back on the career, and, and so many guys, and of course, being the AWA uh, podcast that we are, talk about the guys that were lightest in the ring, that were the night off, and then... Uh, on the flip side, talk about the guys that either hurt you unintentionally, intentionally, or, you know, you just dreaded getting in the ring with them. Well, the two lightest guys, the easiest to work with were Ray and Tommy Rich. Oh. Tommy Rich was actually lighter than Ray. He was unbelievably light. Uh Nick was one of the stiffest guys in the ring. Your buddy. That's what I heard. Boy, yeah. he'd throw a forearm and knock the wind out of you. And uh, guys who were terrible in the ring, there weren't too many. I had I Scott Hall when he first started. He hurt Jake Milk, Jake the Milkman, his first match, and I had him on TV in in uh, Las Vegas the next week. And I buried Scott Hall. Good. I kept him on the mat with my tunic around his. I didn't let him touch me. And ten years later in New York, he was he was bitching at me about it. Yeah. Well, then he had, Leon, he had Leon White, who didn't give a shit about anybody or what he did to mm -hmm. you. I mean, I came out of a ring out of the ring in Vegas with him, and I was just a bloody mess. And I got it from trying to protect him. I mean, he was just terrible. What do you what do you say to the well, not what do you say, but what possesses these guys? I mean, they're over anyway. You know, they're getting yeah. the porch. You're not. You're there to make them look good, and they still take liberties with you. Okay, I don't let's, understand. Let's look at the let's look at the Road Warriors. When they were in Atlanta, the office told them. Just beat the shit out of the job guys. That's what they were told. So what can you expect? You know, so they came up here to work for us up here in the AWA. And I called Greg and I said, I won't work with them. I said, don't even. And they were, they came to my locker on the way out of the TV taping. And Hawk came. He said, who the hell are you not to work with us? Oh. I said, I'm a guy who has a job on Monday. Yeah. And then I got stuck with them when I went to New York later on in their career. And the first time they were in, it said LOD against Tom Stone and somebody. And I went and I found Animal. I said, Animal, you got your chance. Because in the AWA, I could have said no, but I didn't have that same power in New York. And Animal said, shit, you were smart not to work with us. We didn't know what the hell we were doing. So <laughs> by that time, they had lightened up and had realized it was a work. 
you know, those, I, are the, those are the only guys I can't think of any other ones that I had any problems with. You know, I know it's a tough business, you know, granted. And, you know, the business has certainly changed and people believe back then and, and guys like you and, and the guys that were getting the main event push, uh, you know, made it look legit and the fans weren't in on the secret and so on and so forth. I get all that, but I don't get the mindset of a promoter when you're there and they're not paying you a ton of money. You're there to make the stars look good and put asses in the seats, you know, at their next house show. And then these guys are given carte blanche to go on the ring and beat the piss out of you. I don't yeah. get the mindset. Well, it was so few guys, though. It wasn't most of them weren't that way. Most okay. of them most of them were like Ray Stevens. And Ray, when I first started in the business, first thing he said to me was my body is a fine piece of bone china, and so is yours. I'll give you mine, you give me yours, and we give it back in the same same condition when we're done. That was the first thing I was ever taught. Maybe they weren't taught that. That but, is a really good way to look at it. Like I, I, th I mean, that's that's really good. I, I want to ask you about you know Sheik uh, Adnan LKC. And uh, you and Steve-O beating Stan Hansen and Bobby Duncan. Okay. Well, that so, one, I'm still mad at Steve-O. Because well, they won the match, 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 and then they go to the house shows, and Steve has a new partner. How, how can that be fair? I, you know, perhaps he, he was jealous that you were outshining him in the ring, Tom. I well, mean, I'm sure I didn't. I'm sure I'm the one who sold it. He made the comeback. Did, <laughs> did did you and Steve, by the way, have a chance to uh, to reunite? You know, I I think he, he told didn't, me he, he didn't, didn't remember act, you. He didn't act like he even knew who I, me or Chris were. Because wow. I walked up to him at the at your reunion and I just walked over and said, "I'm still mad at you." And he looked at me like, "What?" I said, "I'm still pissed at you." And I told that same story. I said, "We win, and you take a different partner." And I still don't. He said, well, that, that wasn't my call. I don't think he even knew who I was. Well, you know, you could blame it on that herpes sore that he had years it ago. Or awesome. the, you know, maybe maybe it, you know, lingered for a while and he just, you know, something happened. And, and as far as Adnan, I worked him once on TV up in Minneapolis. And at the time, I wanted to try this new move. I turnbuckled the guy and have him move. And I put a high knee into the top. Uh, turnbuckle and go over the top rope to the floor. Okay. I had done it a couple times. It was an easy bump, but that night or that afternoon, I felt the ring post graze my temple on the way out. Oh. I mean, it could have been bad. And while I hit the floor and I didn't sell the bump at all, I charged back into the ring and started beating the shit out of Adna. And I could hear, I could hear Roger Kent while I was in the ring going, Stone should land on his head more often. Because <laughs> I, yeah. I jumped in and made a big comeback on Adnan. I didn't sell that thing at all. I was so glad to be alive. Adnan is Adnan, you know, and, and uh, I had most of my opportunity to work with him long past his prime. Uh, and and I, I remember at some of the local indie shows, a guy would back Adnan into the corner and maybe want to give him a forearm shot or something, and Adnan would always turn. He'd turn the back a little bit, or, you know, he. It, it looked to me like Adnan really didn't want to take a lot of punishment. No, he it, probably it, didn't. <laughs> but uh, he was. Your Highness! He was a good guy. I liked Adnan. Oh, Adnan is a, a wonderful guy. Wonderful guy. I, you know, I, before I forget, when you and I. You know, we knew each other in the early 1970s, and then literally it was about 15, 16 years, uh, back to 87 at the showboat. For a guy who had been through the AWA's best days, and you really were, I mean, I don't think there was a better era as far as talent, overall talent, the roster in the AWA than the 1970s. 
when you come back in 1987 and it kind of what triggered that for me was when you mentioned Tommy Rich, uh, because Tommy's here at that time and Adrian Adonis and Blackwell is still there and so on and so forth. Did you kind of have this feeling like this just isn't the same? Did you sense that the AWA was in trouble? Yeah, I knew, I knew they were in trouble when we were doing Vegas. So I was also working for New York at the time. So I was working both promotions. And I, I told Greg, I said, they want me to work in New York. He said, go ahead. You know, so I had Greg's blessing on the thing. So I was doing both. I, I knew the times. Our talent roster was pretty bad by that time. Yeah, yeah. You know, when you're pushing a young Scott Hall, who was nothing like he became, and the, the talent was just, there was nothing left. Well, you know, even at, at that point, and then we're going to go ahead to the, uh, the Team Challenge Series here, which which another one, that's another thing that you have bragging rights to. We're going to talk about that Team Challenge Series. But I, I think back to that AWA roster in the late 80s at the Showboat. And as you said, you know, what was once a grand and glorious roster, now you, you're and, – and this is not to denigrate the young guys – who were coming in at that time. Vern went to Eddie Sharkey, you know, and, and got a lot of Eddie's guys. But, you know, you, you had your JT Southerns and you had your Jammin' Mitch Snows and, and guys like this. And then you had the Rochester TV tapings. So to a guy like me, you know, who was born and bred AWA and went through the glory days, it was a pretty sad time back then. And, and being in the locker room, too, I noticed there was a lot of tension, you know, especially with Vern. You know, things were, were kind of going south. Did you kind of remove yourself from that situation, just go in and do your job, or could you feel the tension? No, I – yeah, you could feel it. But I think they knew it was over, too. They knew they weren't going to compete anymore. They were trying to hang on uh, – I mean, I never, I never, I never changed what I did with them. You know, I br I bring in most of the job guys, and when we had our meetings in Vegas, I'd sit down with Greg and tell him, "No, I think you should have that guy working with this guy." And one night, I changed everything around and had one guy working three times on one tape. But, <laughs> oh, I, that's that's changing things around. And Greg looked at it and said, you got told us three times on the third tape. I said, well, you shouldn't have listened to me. So I never had a problem. I got along good with all of the guys, including Vern, including Greg. I never had a problem. You know, we're looking at a picture right now, and I, I know we got to go back to Chris's question about uh, Bobby Duncan and Stan Hansen because I, I got to hear about those two guys, two, two, uh, you know, two featherweights in the ring. But talk about the guy that you've got the chin lock on there now. I know that Jake Milliman is so close to you. We so desperately wanted Jake to come in for the reunion. He's had some health issues. Another AWA legend. Talk about Jake a little bit. Well, Jake has been my friend for not quite as long as I've known you, but probably for 40 years. He was a guy who, under the right circumstances, just because of his unique look, someone could have made him a star. He could have been. And unfortunately, he got the Jesse thing, that, you know, give Jake a break. And then Jesse left halfway through the program. But I know they did, did work Denver, and they paid Jesse four grand for the show, and they paid Jake two. And Jake was the draw at that time, not of Jesse. Of course, yeah. of course. So, I will tell you a Jake and Adnan story, a real good one. They were in oh, Vegas, wait. and it was the afternoon. You know, they have the Las Vegas sun. They're up by the pool, and Adnan told Jake, "This kind of sun in the with no humidity, you won't burn." <laughs> well, when Jake went to the ring that night after four hours in the Vegas sun. He was as red as a lobster. 
And you know what the boys did for that whole match, right? Oh, I couldn't. Oh, no. Or a slap or they <laughs> they killed that poor guy. Oh my oh. god. The, the the man probably had to look like you know a freshly painted park bench, you know, yeah. where somebody's got <laughs> <Yes>. paint. You <laughs> know <laughs> Oh, oh boy, man. All right, Chris. Uh, you know, you mentioned Bobby Duncan's Stan Hansen. Yeah, I, I got to hear that. I mean, you, you talk about two legends in the business. Talk about them a little bit, Tom. Well, I don't even remember much about that. I just know me and Olsonowski worked with them. Now, Duncan, he would fly for jobbers. Yeah, you could slam them and you could backdrop them and you could hip toss them. And Hansen, you just didn't want to get hit by his lariat. And I don't really remember, but they wanted to get Steve over. So Steve ended up pinning them. So that was my second winning match on TV. Steve wound up getting the win, but but you'll put that in your in well, your when we were a tag team. I get it. I get it. I they didn't I, pin I, me. Our I team pinned them. I won. You don't have to convince me of that. You know, it's another Buddy Rose and Doug Summer story. You know, Buddy never lost a fall when they were the champions. But, well, you know, nonetheless. Neither all right. did Greg when he was with Jim. Imagine that. Uh, at, at anyway, we're, we're going to take it home here, as we say. But not only are you a wrestler, former, you know. No, can we stop? I got to tell one story. I have to get this. Sure. One. I trained the Texas Hangman, both of them, ah. Mike and Rick Antner. And uh, they were being brought in by Vern. And we were in, I believe, Hammond, Indiana. I could be wrong. But we were somewhere down by Chicago. And they were in a six-man tag match with the Guerrero brothers. Oh. Not Eddie. It was Mondo, Chavo, and I'm not sure who the third one was. Was it Hector? Was it Hector? Hector. Okay. And their partner was the executioner that night, who was sometimes known as Tom Stone. <laughs> well, I believe that the office had told the Guerreros not to sell for Mike and Rick because the Guerreros didn't sell anything they did, but they flew all over the ring for me. I wasn't coming in as one of the hangmen. So wow. I believe in my heart that that was a rib by Greg and Vern on the hangman. Hmm. How great is that? Uh, uh, God. And I love, I love Mike. I've just recently gotten to know him. He seems like just one of the genuinely nicest people that I can recall meeting. And he's I'm a good guy, and he is he's writing a book right now. And I've read the first six chapters probably better than my book. Well, that's not possible, and that's how we're actually gonna take it home because you former wrestler, you know, ringside. Bell ringer, timekeeper, and author. Yes. Let's talk about the uh, the Tom Stone publication. Well, I've got a book on Amazon. It's called Professional Wrestling, The Theater of the Absurd. And it's just road stories, basically, of my time in, with Vern, with New York, local, my, the, my own local shows, uh, Mid-South. There's a lot of good, fun stories. I think anyone who likes wrestling will get a glimpse into behind the scenes. That's tremendous. And and how do they access the book? Got to go to Amazon. It's both a Kindle and a soft cover. Okay. All right. Well, before we go let ahead. you go, and I, I know we're running into a time crunch here, you probably aren't going to remember this, but I have to address this story. Back in, I don't know, 71, 72, you and that that Kevin guy. Kevin you know, they were the, Yeah. Charter members of the brigade were at the St. Paul Auditorium. And I don't know, you guys were in town for a brigade convention or whatever the hell it was. But you started, like, play wrestling in the back of the auditorium. And the ushers got hot. Now, I know you're not going to remember this, but for some reason, because I was in the, in the vicinity – they, they said, get your friends the hell out of the building before we 86 them. So to this day, I'm thinking, what in God's name did I have to do with you and Kevin throwing headlocks and chops at each other 
in the back of the St. Paul Auditorium, I got the guilt by association. No wonder Vern didn't book me for the next 15 years. That never happened. Oh, shit. I don't remember that. I'm sure you don't. And Olsonowski doesn't remember you. I, I Honestly, I don't even remember being at a show up there. Oh, yeah, you were at a show up there, believe me. Don't remember that. All right, well, with that, ladies and gentlemen, I, I got to tell you, Tom, honest to God, this is this has been great. I mean, I, I'm like a kid in a candy store here yeah. in these old stories. And if anybody does not appreciate not only the work of Tom Rocky Stone, but of the carpenters in the business, because of the way the business has changed, you have no idea. You have absolutely no idea how glorious those days were. I can't thank you enough. Well, I appreciate being on. Thanks for having me. Take it away, Chris. All right, there he is. I'm just going to go ahead and uh, take him out of the stream right now, and uh, we'll get back to him here in a minute after we're done. Uh, that was great. I, Mick, to me, what made that conversation with you guys was just, it was so natural and free-flowing, and just those are the stories that I, I feel like we want to hear because now we're just in that quote-unquote, that breaking kayfabe era where now we can really get those stories from the, the mouths of guys like Tom Stone, who were such a big part of the history of the AWA and just going back on your friendship with him. I just, I feel like there's so much meat on that bone and it, this was a great and absolutely great episode. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it uh, as much as I did just kind of sitting back and, you know, listening to, to what you guys were, were talking about uh, to wrap it up here. Um, you know, I want to thank 7th Avenue Pizza. Uh, you can see right there, 7thAvenuePizza.com if you're looking for some great frozen pizza. Uh, if you want to know about, like, if you've got a topic or anything you want to know about, uh, hit us up on the Slick Mick Old School Wrestling page or the AWA Unleashed Fans page on Twitter. If you're not a part of it or if you've not subscribed as well, you guys, I cannot tell you enough, ask you enough. Subscribe to us on YouTube. That's the best way to help us grow this thing. Uh, subscribe, rate, review. We're on uh, Apple, iTunes, Spotify. I don't know. Maybe we're on MySpace. Uh, I, I have no idea. But we are just pretty much everywhere where you can get your uh, get your get um, any of your podcast, you know, podcast shows. So that being said, Mick, we got about uh, two minutes before we're ready to bring it home. And uh, let's go ahead and get to the shout outs. Shout outs, I got a double. I got a two out of three fall. Uh, well, wait a minute. I, I thought this was just one. Oh, no, shit. you only get that's all right. You know, you don't have to crawl up. No, it's okay. No, no, no. You know, I, you know what? And as a matter of fact, I might have changed it on you. Oh, no, there they are. They're, okay, they're, good. They're, uh, Mike Warkle and Joe Mackle. Known them for 30 years, wrestling fans in the Twin Cities, especially the old PWA fans. Mike Warkle worked as referee Mike Diamond, and Joe Macko, my good buddy, worked as Stan Gagne. Uh, they were referees for Eddie Sharkey back in the day and two great friends, so uh, double shout-out this week. And uh, I'm going to give mine to uh, Scott Schmidt. Met him at the reunion, and then uh, had a, I ran into him again at the, uh, the MAW show at Tartan a couple weeks ago, and... Uh, I still got something coming your way, Scott, and uh, he knows what that means. So uh, anyway, that being said, uh, again, you guys, thank you so much. Rate, review, subscribe. Um, YouTube, just hit it. I mean, it, you know, I'll even pay for it. You know, I'll pay for you be able to, to subscribe to us. So that's how much, you know, that's Boy, how much you're I care. A, you're a generous guy. You know, ho, 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 yo. Um, all right. That being said, I want to thank uh, Tom Stone and... Mick, we'll uh, come back at it next week. We got some good guests coming up, ladies and gentlemen. Stay tuned. Who's that? <laughs>